Our kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful we can come to you and that you hear our prayers and we would humble ourselves before you. And we do ask that you send your spirit into this congregation that as Mary presents our sermon today, we would hear the words of God in our ears and in our hearts and apply them that we might go out and be a blessing to others for the blessings you have given us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, I'm so glad to be here and thank you for inviting me um, another time. So I'm just going to start with a word of prayer and then we will listen to what God has to say to us today. Let's pray. Our kind, loving Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for life and we thank you that you are always with us and we can trust in your word. Today, God, take control. Hide me behind the cross. And may we listen to your voice and not mine. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Jesus said, let go of the branch. There was an old story of a man. And this man fell over the cliff and 
as he was falling and he was definitely going to die, he stretched out his arm and miraculously was able to, was able to hold onto a branch. And so as he's holding on to that branch, he calls out. And he says, is, every, is anybody up there? And a voice, he hears a voice, and he says, and that voice says, yes. He says, well, who's up there? It's, it's God, it's me. I'm going to save you. And he says, wonderful. What do I need to do? He says, let go of the branch. Is anybody else out there? I want you to turn to Mark. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35 to 40. That's Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 40. March, not March, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Jesus said, listen to what Jesus said. Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great storm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I'm sure you're familiar with this story, and maybe you even listened to it when you were a little child. Um, but if you linger a little more, on this account, there might be some questions that come to your mind, right? And there might be questions as you are reading this, um, and I have some questions, but they're like, how could you questions? You know those questions that really are not questions, but really statements of blame, right? Like, how could you leave me? Or how could you not pick up that thing that I told you to pick up? Or, you know, there's many things that we, we ask. How could you? So as I linger a little bit on this story, I would like to ask some how could you questions. And I think the first question that I would like to ask is to the disciples. I just imagine with me, go on this journey with me, that I am with the disciples, and I think that I probably, just reading the account of the disciples, we know that Peter was pretty outspoken. And so I think that I would get into a conversation with Peter. And I would ask Peter, Peter, I have a question. How could you forget that Jesus was in the boat? Well, I think probably Peter would say to me, well, we're men of the sea. And so as men of the sea, when the storm comes, we do what we know what to do. Or maybe he would say something else. Maybe he would say that the storm was happening and they had been trained. They had actually been on the sea for since they were little, and so as the storm was starting, they did what they were trained to do, right? They trimmed the sail, they aimed it to the wind, they took care of it. And of course, they had to do some bailing over, but as things got worse and worse, we figured, right, if we that are experienced don't know what to do in this storm, what could Jesus do? I don't know, maybe that's what he would say. But I actually think that this is probably what Peter would say to me. He probably would say that as the storm started to happen, they did everything that they could do. 
and it got worse and worse and worse and f as they were frantically trying to save their lives and doing all of that, that in that midst and frank frankness, they forgot that Jesus was in the boat. I think that's probably what he would have said. But knowing Peter, and we all know Peter, he probably was not one to just allow that to be, uh, you know, just allow that to be. He probably was one that liked to have the last word. And he would look at me and he would say, you know, Mary, I don't really like the tone of your question. How could I forget that Jesus was in the storm? Well, I want to ask you a question. Remember when you were flying to go to South Africa and you were on the plane and suddenly there was a lot of turbulence? And it was so bad that the flight attendant said that everybody needed to sit down and fasten their seatbelt. You remember how you were feeling? You remember your heart beating? You remember gripping to the armrest, praying God that you wouldn't die? You remember that? You remember swallowing hard because you couldn't even breathe? What happened, Mary? Do you not believe that Jesus flies Emirates? Hmm. I'd look at him and I would say, okay, you're right. Let's just agree that I'm not gonna ask you any questions and then you don't ask me any questions, okay? Because the truth is, I guess both of us have sometimes forgotten that Jesus is in the boat with us, yeah. But I want to continue with a second question. And this question I want to ask to Jesus. But remember, it's a how could you question. And I want to be respectful because he is our Lord. But I still would like to ask one question to Jesus. I'd look at Jesus and I would say, Jesus, how could you sleep in such a storm? And maybe Jesus would say to me, well, you know I'm a deep sleeper. Maybe, maybe he would say that. Or maybe he would say, Mary, read the account. It was a very busy day. There were lots of people around and I was teaching and I was preaching and I was healing and I was tired and exhausted. And by the time I got into the boat, and my head hit that cushion, I was out. I don't even think if the boat sunk, I would have woken up. I was exhausted. Maybe, maybe he would say that. But as I read the gospel, I notice something that Jesus does a lot, um, which was actually a custom in those days. When people would come to Jesus and ask a question, Many times he would, he would answer by asking another question, right? And I think that Jesus would look at me and he would ask me a question. He would say, Mary, you remember when you were young and you would go on these trips with your family? Every year, um, and I come from Madagascar, we would go on these trips with my family. And my dad was that kind of dad that he wanted to get to his destination, right? My husband is that way too. Um, but I remember just begging my dad to just stop and he would always be like, oh yeah, we're gonna stop. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll stop, we'll just go a little ways. And in Madagascar, there are a lot of mountains. And so we would go on these long trips and they were, the roads were actually quite dangerous. Um, it was in the mountains and there were a lot of cars that would actually crash, um, but we would go on these trips. So Jesus would 
look at me and he said, well, what, what did you do? Oh, well, we would go on the trips and my brothers and I would sit at the back and we would, you know, play and talk and as siblings, we probably fought. And as the sun went down and there wasn't really much to do, we would fall asleep. And miles and miles later, um, when the sun would come up and you could see it in the horizon, we would wake up and we were miles and miles closer to our destination. So Jesus would look at me and he would say, well, Mary, even as a young person, I'm sure you knew how dangerous those roads were. Well, yeah, I knew they were dangerous. Why did you sleep? Oh, well, that's easy, I would say to Jesus. My dad, he's a really good driver. And, and so I trusted him. And Jesus would look at me and he'd say, yeah, mine too. He's a great captain of ship and of seas and of souls. I feel like I could end here, but as I look at you guys, you probably maybe have a how could you question for me. How could you say that we just need to stay and be at peace and that we could rest in his providence? You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how hard this year has been for me. You don't know that I might be struggling with cancer or some kind of disease. My spouse may be dying. I'm not talking to my kids. You don't know. How could you say that I just need to be at peace and rest in his providence? I remember when I was in the seminary, um, I had a professor, and this professor actually lived in Israel. And so he knew a lot about the culture of Israel. And um, he had some insight in the world of the dead, of which this one was one. In the ancient world that Jesus was part of, the water often referred to, um, was referred to as the deep. And it was thought that it was the abode of chaos, of darkness, of evil. And the disciples, they were part of this world. And in fact, they might have even really believed in that. And so you understand that that day when they are in that storm, they not only were physically in that storm, but because of what they believed, that they probably believed that it was, they were in the depths of evil and darkness. It was a clash of titans. It was a war of ages. It was the conflict between good and evil. It was a time of uncertainty and a time of chaos and war. As I shared last time, that we were living in Congo Democratic and my family had decided that we were going to stay, but it got so bad that we had to cross the river. And we had to cross this river that is one of the longest river in, in Africa. Um, I think probably the longest river here is the Mississippi and the Missouri River, which is uh, 2,000, maybe 2,300 miles. So this one is close to 3,000 miles. Um, and it is one of the deepest rivers in Africa. The situation was so bad that we had to cross. And we got into this boat and it was crammed. It was probably a boat that held 100 people, but there were more like 300 people on that boat. And we started to journey to Congo Brazzaville, which borders Congo. And we got to the other side, getting away from that storm. 
we got to the other side and we were greeted by a pastor. And that pastor took us to where we were going to stay. And for a year, the sea was calm. It was really just calm. But unexpectedly, a storm came into our lives. The rebels that had been in Congo were now in Brazzaville. And they had taken siege of Congo Brazzaville. And we were stuck at home. All we could hear were bombs that were being dropped. And we could not leave the house. We were living with a couple of missionaries and as the war started to get worse and worse, um, and there were large shells now that were blasting through our house. And I remember, I remember having to, at night, go under my bed because it was so dangerous. You could not sit in a chair. Um, and I just remember praying under my bed and asking God to protect us. But it had gotten really bad, and our house was being destroyed by, um, by, by the shelling. And the families, the missionaries, had gotten together, and we had to make a decision. And so, as a family, we decided that we were going to um, go back to that river that we had crossed. And... I remember my father talking to, to us and, and telling us that we were going to make this dangerous journey. And he had some money with him and he, he um, gave each one of us some money that we would hide in our shoes. Because what happened was the rebels had taken over and they were everywhere. And as you would go from, there would be checkpoints, as, as you would go from one checkpoint, they would stop you and they would take all your money. But we needed money in order to travel to the other side of the river. And so my parents said, keep this money in your shoes and don't say anything. And so we didn't have a car. We called someone, a taxi driver, and... Uh, after much convincing, because this was wartime and it was quite dangerous, he agreed to take us to the border. And so we got in the car and we started to drive. And just a few miles as we drove, there was a checkpoint and there were lots of rebels there. And they stopped us. And all of them surrounded our car, and they said, get out of the car. And so we all went out of the car, and they were like, what are you doing here? Do you not realize that it is dangerous? What are you doing out here? And so my dad prayed, and he said, we are missionaries, and we are wanting to go to the border. Are you crazy? Do you not realize that people are dying everywhere and you are wanting to go to the border? No, you're not going anywhere. Give us all your money. And so my dad had some money in his pocket. <clears throat> and he took that out and he said, this is the money that I have. And he said, he took the money. Um, and one thing you need to realize is that um, these were rebels but it was very difficult to be in a war. And so in order to cope with that, they would be um, on, on very, um, very strong drugs because there was carnage and, and it was an awful time. And so they, just to survive, would, um, they, they, they would drink and they would be on drugs so they could just continue. And so there was no, there was no way that we could negotiate with any of them because they were not even really in their right mind. So my father asked them, he said, where's your leader? Let me talk to your leader. And the soldier was like, okay, um, there's, there's the leader. So he went to the leader and he, he said, um, we are missionaries here and 
I have my family here and my, ch my, my, my wife and my children, and we would like to go to the border. And the leader looked at him and he said, that's crazy. You realize that you are going into war zone where there are lots of rebels there. Why would you go there? I, I need to have my family be safe. I need to go to the border. And so the leader looked at him and he said, OK, I will allow you to go. But I don't think you realize how dangerous it is. There's been constant shelling. And it will be a miracle if you're not blown to pieces. But if you insist, go ahead. So we went back into the taxi. and. The driver started to drive, and we went from one checkpoint to another. And when you look at the distance between where we were to where the border was, it really was just not, not a very long distance, but it was probably the longest journey we ever took. My mom and my brothers were praying and my dad was in the car, and as he looked outside, there were bodies everywhere. And the dogs were eating the bodies. It was terrible. But a verse came to my father's mind, and he remembered. Psalms 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in him whom I trust, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, for he will give his angel charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Because he has loved me, Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And as he was listening, as he was remembering Psalms 91, an idea came into his mind and he was thinking, how am I going to get to the border? And he remembered that there was this pastor that was from the tribe of the rebels. And he called this pastor and he said, Pastor, please, can you talk with the leader of the rebels and convince them for, for them to allow us to, to cross the border? And so my dad was waiting for the answer and finally we get that call and the pastor says, yes, I've made an arrangement with the rebels. They want you to pay $120, and you will be able to go to this little harbor that was all just for fishermen. And so we started to drive. And we got to this little harbor, and there were all the rebels just waiting for us. And we got out of the car. And I remember the rebels, um, they were not, I mean, they were drunk and just really not, not even there. Um, and they, they told us to get out. My dad paid the $120, and then he told us to take all of our suitcases out. And so we took all of our suitcases out. And it's funny because I remember making, I remember, put, you know, putting all my clothes in my suitcase and I had done it so neatly. And he opened my suitcase 
and he took out everything from my suitcase and put it in this muddy clay well, ground, and I was so upset. Isn't that funny? That's the one thing I remember. I was so upset. And I thought, man, I made my suitcase so well, and he is putting it on the ground. But after, after they had taken everything out of our suitcases, they started shooting in the air, and they thought it was hilarious. They thought this was just great fun, and they were taking all of our things. And of course, all of us were just praying. And finally, they, they said, okay, you can go. And so my dad and missionaries went down, down this muddy bank to, the, to, a, to a couple of canoes. And these were fishermen canoes, so they were not, not very big. And we got into the canoe and we just breathed a sigh of relief. Yes. We made it. We were in the canoe, and we were going to head to Kinshasa, which is the capital of Congo. And so uh, the guy was starting to row, but he wasn't moving forward. He was just kind of rowing parallel to the bank. And after a little while, my dad says, what's going on? Why, why are you not going forward? Oh, well, this is very dangerous. This is, this is a really dangerous trip. Uh, we, we cannot go. Uh, we need more money. But we already agreed. that You, you, you agreed that it was going to be 120. Oh, no, no, we need 500 now. So here we were, stuck. My dad had given all the money that he had. Basically, we were stuck in this canoe, and we were not going to cross. After a moment of silence, my dad said to, said to the men, my friend, do you believe in God? Oh yes, I believe in God, he said. Well, I'm sure you were told that we are missionaries. So even if I had that much money, it won't do you any good. You see, we pray to God and he takes care of us. If you were to harm us, you will fall into his hands, and you can be sure he will deal with you. Anything you do to us, you are going to do it to God. So I'm advising you, my father says, to think carefully about what you are doing. The man understood the message. And so my dad offered him $30. He had $30, and he said, you have great he said, you have great paddling skills, so I'm going to give you 30 more dollars. And so we started to head to open water. And as we started to head, we saw soldiers coming down that muddy, coming down the muddy bank. And they started yelling, and they said, stop. And my dad said, keep going, keep going. And the guy is, 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 is paddling and the soldiers are shooting, and they're telling us to stop. And I remember my mom sitting next to me, and she started to sing a hymn. And we all sang. And the soldiers were shooting at us, but nothing happened to us. We just kept singing, and we just kept going and not one bullet reached us. We crossed the boundary line, and we were safe. God prevailed. There is a great conflict between Christ and Satan. But suddenly, in the midst of the conflict, Christ, the rabbi, stands in the ship. He stretches out his arms and he says, stop, be still. And like a giant crumbling to its knee, the storm stops. And there is peace. 
a few months later, Jesus is going to be in another storm, one that will take his life. And this one won't be in a storm, but it's going to be on Calvary. And as he lays there between earth and sky, the forces of evil are, have great power. And this time, he actually goes in the boat and down to the deepest of the depths of the sea. And when he gets to the bottom, he pulls the plug. He opens the drain, and that sea begins to drain. And it continues to drain today, and will continue to drain until that day when one of those in the boat saw in Revelation, and behold, there was no more sea drained dry and we landed safely on the distant shore and so you might be asking me how could i tell you to be to rest and be in peace in god's providence how could i not tell you right how could i not jesus trusted and so i trust and because Jesus prevailed, I will. You see, that man that was hanging on to that branch and Jesus told him to let go, he didn't. But he didn't realize he was only a few, he was only really a few feet from the ground, right? But he would not let go. And today I pray that you just believe that God is powerful and he's wonderful and he is promising you that you can trust in him and that he's going to bring you to that shoreline. So if that's your prayer today, my friend and I are going to sing a song. And as you listen to this song, I pray that once again you recommit your life to him and that no matter what you're going through, that you believe that God is in control and that you can trust him. Why aren't you with? 
willingly choosing to follow him into all that's to come oh my soul why do you hold back why do you reason haven't you seen that in every season he's been there and still now he's with you in all that's to come isn't he faithful can you not trust him isn't he kind and all that he's allowed has always worked for good you can't only imagine my soul you can't even fathom all that he's planned and all that's in store for his promise is true and his word is secure so let faith rise over your fear remind yourself of all of the years you have seen his hand he has brought you through even though this is hard this is nothing new he is here he's all always been silence is seen it's just shadows of death but it's not finished yet and come what may his word will stay oh my soul see all he's done oh my soul remember he's one oh my soul his kindness remains oh my soul lift up your praise the story's not over he isn't finished tis so sweet to trust in jesus just to take him at his word just to know to run his promise and to know the same to trust you today we believe in your word 